In the first season, I traveled to New Zealand, falling in love with the rallying scene. That's why heading back for Targa New Zealand was so special. Kiwis have an obsession with rallying that I sorely missed. This was the first time the Targa was being held in New Zealand's South Island, an astonishingly beautiful place. Add in the echoing sounds of a GT3 cup car, and you have yourself one hell of a spectacle. It's springtime in New Zealand's South Island, and for the next week, this vast landscape will be interrupted by this sound. I landed in Christchurch, and within an hour, I'm face to face with a street legal 997 GT3 Cup car. It's a full race car converted for the road, highlighted in orange with sponsor decals and that huge GT3 Cup wing. Now mind you, this car is from Florida. My friends Gavin and Amy Riches shipped it to New Zealand just for the event. Gavin would drive the car and his wife Amy would navigate. It's a big budget endeavor with the goal to prove that a GT3 Cup car is more than just a track car. I grew up in New Zealand, started rallying in my very early 20s and rallied here for two or three years, mainly on gravel, until I moved to the US in the early 80s and then didn't do any rallying at all until about 10 years ago when I came back and did a Targa and since that time I've done six of them. Started off with a Porsche Carrera S then moved up to a Porsche GT3, and now we are campaigning a 2011 Porsche Cup car. Since it spent the last month in a shipping container, there were a lot of things to iron out, so we got right to testing, and Gavin immediately invited me for a ride along. I grab a camera, I jump in the car with Gavin, and we're just on the roads doing pulls on the car. This Cup car runs a pneumatic paddle shifting set with a short ratio gearbox and ecstasy suspension all developed to be quicker and more agile on the open road. The whine of the gearing and the sound of the Porsche motor on a public road, flat out, is the coolest thing ever. After a couple quick tests, it was on to tech inspection. Rolling the car into scrutineering was when it became obvious. I was back in rally heaven. So as I've learned spending time in New Zealand in the past, you could basically get any kind of car in New Zealand. And Targa is the absolute definition of this because people in Targa rallies have money, so they have the means of creating whatever they want to run. So you had Fiat's and Lancia's and all sorts of regular vintage rally cars, Alpine Renaults, stuff like that. And then you had muscle cars, Mustangs, but along with the vintage cars, you also had supercars. There was a full-on Lamborghini running, there was tons of Porsches, and there was even this crazy Subaru Justy that was all done up with a WRX motor and a turbo. We got tech through and saw Gavin off. The next six days I would spend following the team, witnessing New Zealand's best take to the tarmac. Targa New Zealand has coined the ultimate road race, and for good reason. There are over 800 kilometers of special stages and over 1,800 more kilometers of transiting over six days. We started by leaving Christchurch for Almaru, then into Dunedin, down through the Catlins to Invercargill, then following the stages up to Queenstown. A Targa rally basically bridges the gap between a full performance stage rally and time speed distance rally. Targa New Zealand has competitive time stages and transit routes to get to each stage. 
but the major differences from full-blown stage rally are the longer distances and the max speed limit on competitive stages of 200 kilometers an hour. And there's a reason for the speed limit. Driving these roads 100% blind, that's why they're called blind rallies, so you're going as fast as you possibly can, but you've never driven the road before, you've never been on the road before, and you have no pace notes. This isn't a rally where you have a left four, a left five, a right six. You don't know the corner. So you're seeing it visually and saying, okay, how much is that gonna tighten? Now they do have some warning tulip directions in the route book, but they don't have everything. You typically can't take the risk of going over a blind plow flat. You've got to lift, you've got to make sure that as the, you go over, the road continues straight. These cars will hit 200 kilometers an hour rather quickly. So at some points, the strategy is to get through the corner as quick as possible and get to that speed as soon as possible and hold that speed. The rule is that if you exceed the 200 kilometers, you get a penalty. So you try very hard not to, but it is extremely difficult because one minute you're doing 195 and then all of a sudden you're doing 201 and then you're back to, you know, 197 and then you're over. So you, you really fight not to go over. Oh, 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 back, 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 back. Oh. You're always watching speed where if you've got a speed limit, you just come out of the corner, accelerate up the speed, let the limiter kick in and that's the, the safety factor. So we didn't have that, which made it more challenging. So the two main jobs for Amy sitting right seat were warning Gavin of potential cautions and making sure that he doesn't get penalized for going over 200 kilometers an hour. Co-driving is, is quite a unique experience and quite, a, quite as much of a thrill as driving itself. And you know, it, it really truly takes probably about the same amount of concentration to do either or. So although by the end of a stage, Gavin is, is a bit more physically and mentally spent, I, I'm, I'm probably equally as mentally spent um, because everything is happening so fast and you are just having to be on 100% of the time. It's not very many people that could sit in that seat, call instructions and maintain their composure and you know, where there's just fractions of error time, you know, like just a slight mistake and you're in for a major crash. So you just have to have complete faith, both in the car and the driver, that, you know, everything's going to be okay. And she did a, a marvelous job and I, I can't compliment her enough. By this time we had two days in the back. Gavin and Amy were running towards the front of the field over some amazing roads in the Otago Peninsula. quick service in Dunedin, and then the route headed south through the Catlins. So I was able to get around and see a lot of spots in this rally following Gavin's crew, Malcolm and Lou, in their van. So we went out to the end of the Catlins stage waiting for them to come in to get some fuel to head back to Inver Cargill. And we're waiting there, and one of the Porsches comes up, and they say, yeah, we passed Gavin on stage, he's out. Gavin stopped in the iron scanner, then He had the bonnet up, but okay, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. yeah, it yeah. doesn't mean nothing. Stopped about halfway in. One of the Ford Escort, Dean Buse, stopped and said, uh, you're supporting the Porsche, it stopped about halfway in. Sometime later, without warning, Gavin came rolling in. The muffler blew apart completely at the back, which allowed the hot exhaust gases to blow onto the front of the engine. In the process, they melted the drive belt and melted the air box, caused the car to come to a halt in the middle of a special stage. We did eventually get a new belt on, which we had in the car with us, and we drove the car out of the stage. What's the matter? It was on fire when we stopped. It was burning the belt. Oh, we changed it. Is the muffler gone? Yes, bad. Apparently. Bad enough to melt the belt. We pulled the exhaust off in service and then got the car to a shop where it could be welded up and refitted. The mishap on stage cost Gavin and Amy 23 minutes, losing their lead. The hopes of a potential target victory were gone. 
So once we got the car back to full potential, we turned our attention to the Crown Range Pass. If we were going to make any statement that a GT3 Cup car is a solid tarmac rally car, we were going to do it at the Crown Range. Now this is a road that starts in Queenstown and basically winds hairpin, 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 all the way up over the pass and then down into Wanaka. And it's a long road and it starts super windy and then opens up with these fast flowing left and right handers through a valley. If you remember from season one, I had some fun playing around in the Crown Range Pass with my Toyota Starlet. Obviously that was just joking around, but now there's real cars here and a proper rally. It's truly a once in a lifetime experience. This road does not get closed very often and it doesn't really get raced ever. So this is one of the very few times maybe in the history of the world that the Crown Range will become a racetrack. Gavin and Amy pulled to the start line. For the next 10 minutes, they'd be fighting the front of the field for a record through the pass. One, go! Watching that thing leave the start line and then rip up the hairpins to start. And then the helicopter follows them and you just kind of cross your fingers and you're like, you know it gets way faster up there. I just kind of hope they keep it on the road because there's some solid drops on the ends of the Crown Range. The car pulls well, hairpin to hairpin. They reach the highest point of the road, fastest up the hill. From here, the road opens up, charging downhill through the valley towards Cardrona. Seven minutes in, and they're so quick, Martin Dippy's 911 GT3 is caught and passed. Once clear of the traffic, it was just a few more corners, and then Back in Queenstown, the results were in. Gavin and Amy were fastest overall through the Crown Range. It wasn't the outright victory they came for, but a record time through the pass was an incredible feat that made all the effort worthwhile. Two wheel drive cars have won in the past, but only because of attrition. This year, for the first time, we were actually able to run with the four wheel drive cars, the best of them, on stage time. So for us, that was a huge gain and something that we're really happy that we've achieved and gives us confidence for future events that we will be able to be on a more equal footing. We had a quick celebration in Queenstown and then packed the car up to ship to the States. I said goodbye to the land of rally cars and sheep and shipped myself to another part of the globe. I'm off to Ecuador to see a different rally culture. But you'll have to stay tuned for that and other stories in the beginning of 2017 because for now, I'm taking a short break. Everyone, thank you so much for watching my series. I'll be sharing South America's rally culture with you soon. Woohoo! Hairpins. I'm gonna party with you.